Unit eighteen analysis one through two. A more powerful example of the role of uncertainty in innovation comes from science. The greatest asset of the scientific tradition, after all, is its continual self-scrutiny and skepticism. Accepting uncertainty, at least at the level of scientific communities, is the defining feature of science. It's not a defect. Two giants of the philosophy of science, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. Both emphasized this point in different ways. For Popper, intellectual honesty means trying to refute rather than prove a theory about the world. For Kuhn, science leaps forward when contradictions pile up and lead to giving up a dominant theory. In each view, the acceptance of uncertainty precedes new ideas and discoveries. Uncertainty, as climate scientist Tamson Edwards put it recently, is the engine of science. The editors of Nature once wrote that if science didn't progress darkly up and down many blind alleys and false trails, from hypothesis to hypothesis, then science would soon end. That's why it is the responsibility of scientific journals and scientific writers to be distrustful. The openness at the heart of the scientific spirit means never taking error personally, seeing success as temporary, and welcoming criticism. Unit eighteen, analysis one through three. A farmer had some puppies he needed to sell. He painted a sign advertising the pups and began nailing it to a post on the edge of his yard. As he was driving the last nail into the post, he felt a tug on his overalls. He looked down into the eyes of a little boy. "Mister," he said, "I want to buy one of your puppies." "Well," said the farmer as he rubbed the sweat off the back of his neck. These puppies come from fine parents and cost a good deal of money. The boy dropped his head for a moment, then reaching deep into his pocket, he pulled out a handful of change and held it up to the farmer. "I've got thirty-nine cents. Is that enough to take a look?" "Sure," said the farmer, and with that he let out a whistle. "Here, Dolly," he called. Out from the doghouse and down the slope ran Dolly, followed by four little balls of fur. The little boy pressed his face against the chain-link fence. His eyes danced with delight. As the puppies made their way to the fence, the little boy noticed something else stirring inside the doghouse. Slowly, another little ball appeared. This one noticeably smaller. Down the slope it slid. Then, in a somewhat awkward manner, the little pup began hobbling toward the others, doing its best to catch up. "I want that one," he said, pointing to the puppy. The farmer knelt down at the boy's side and said, "Son, you don't want that puppy. He will never be able to run and play with you like these other dogs would." With that, the little boy stepped back from the fence, reached down. And began rolling up one leg of his trousers. In doing so, he revealed a steel brace running down both sides of his leg, attaching itself to a specially made shoe. 
Looking back up at the farmer, he said, You see, sir, I don't run too well myself, and he will need someone who understands. Practice 1 through 2. While managing a project in Mexico City, you notice that one of your employees is particularly intelligent, successful, and diligent. Thinking he would make a great addition to the home office in Chicago, you offer him a job. Although your employee would receive a promotion, a large salary increase, and a company car if he moves to Chicago, he declines your offer. You simply cannot understand why he refuses the offer when it would be so beneficial to his career. Many highly successful people in Mexico and parts of Central and South America do not make career decisions based primarily on their own self interest, as is often the case north of the Rio Grande. In Mexico, people tend to first consider the needs of their family or company. Before considering their own self interest. Receiving a promotion and higher salary would not be the most compelling reasons to take a new position. Rather, your employee would think primarily about the interests of extended family members, many of whom probably would not want him to move. Then the employee would consider the interests of the local company, which probably needs him to continue working in Mexico City. What is best for the individual is not always the prime factor in a job decision. Practice 3 through 5. The Writers Guild in Hollywood in early 2008 had been on strike for three months. John Bowman, the Guild's chief negotiator, was supposed to speak with Stuart Diamond on a phone call set up by a prominent Hollywood agent. Listen to what Stuart says. The agent, Ari Emanuel, said to him, Take notes. It was a Tuesday afternoon. Bowman had a breakfast scheduled for Thursday morning with representatives of the major Hollywood studios to talk about the dispute. He had a number of substantive issues and wanted to know the order in which to bring them up royalties, basic compensation, etc. Stewart told him to put aside those issues, at least for now. That was not the problem. The problem was that everyone was mad at everyone else and everyone was losing money. Make small talk, Stuart said. Ask them, are you happy? They will not be happy and they will admit it. They may start blaming you and the Writers Guild. That's okay, Stuart added. Sympathize with them, he continued. Ask them, if we had to start over again, what process would you like to see? At first, Bowman was skeptical. Stewart told him a negotiation is about the people and gave him some examples. People like to give things to others who listen to them, who value them, who consult with them. During another phone call a few days later, Bowman said he followed his advice completely. At this point, what did he have to lose? The result? At the breakfast meeting, the parties agreed to restart negotiations after months of failure. It took only a few days to get an agreement. Almost immediately, the strike ended.